All righty, you're on this webinar for a reason. And that reason is for you to learn how to practice better so that you can train better, so that ultimately you can perform better. Golf is not an easy sport, we know that. And the reason you're here is you wanna find a reason and also an understanding into your performance so that we can maximize how you get the most out of your game. There's no doubt when we play golf, we wanna leave the golf course feeling empowered. We wanna feel excited. And more importantly, we wanna feel prideful of how we do. Unfortunately for many of us, the difficulty of golf is that we're, it's like we're walking around playing with soap bubbles. The more we want it, the more we're gonna squeeze it. And the more we squeeze it, the faster those bubbles pop. Now, what I want you to understand as a player, as a coach, as a consultant, or any of the, or, you know, any of the different levels around it, is that your ability to play your best, the ability to get the best out of your players, is when you get them just close to that point. And there's a special psychological skill that brings us forward. And that magic is when we sometimes let go and trust our training and our preparation, and more importantly, we make the results work for us. Golf has been talked about for many, many years as almost having a magical experience behind it, a spiritual awakening that occurs when you're playing great golf. And while I don't disagree with that, I think the bigger challenge is, is that it's not so much about the magical experience as it is the resiliency and the grit that it takes you to play a great round of golf. You're gonna play a, a round of golf over 18 holes and whatever you shoot, let's just say you shoot even par, you're not gonna hit 72 great shots. You're gonna hit maybe a third of really good shots and a third not so good. The problem when we look at golf from a spiritual perspective, as if you're gonna have a spiritual experience or awakening when you play, is that you fail to really capture the work it takes in practice to prepare you for the uncertainty that you're gonna compete in. I want you to understand what it really takes to compete and to play your best is how to practice. And my experience over the years working with many, many tour players, including 11 victories on the PGA Tour and the Worldwide Tours last year, and several already this year, is that you have to prepare for the uncertainty and more importantly, enhance the skills that you have mentally, physically, and resiliency wise to be able to overcome whatever you're about to go through. I tell all my players that whenever they get in the heat of the moment, they need to reflect back in four different areas, how pressure impacted them physically, how pressure impacted them psychologically, and how pressure impacted their decision-making and their resiliency. So when a player practices and practices ineffectively or inefficiency, inefficiently, what happens is they're hoping to play well versus preparing to work through anything in the preparation cycle. See, I want you to prepare and know that when you go out to compete, that the work, the hard, hard work has been done. And it's not about letting go and letting it go where it needs to go, but it's letting go of the need to validate how good you are as a player and instead trust the training that you've put in so that you can go out and compete at a higher level. If I told you the game of golf was actually a puzzle, you'd probably look at it differently but it's exactly what it is. It's a puzzle that requires you to work through each individual incre incremental moment and turning the puzzle piece, looking at it from a different angle and understanding that once you see the puzzle piece turn and you see how it fits into that corner of your picture, all of a sudden the light bulb goes off and you go, aha, I got it. That's the same thing I want you to do. So as a player, I want you to understand that we're gonna enhance not your best magical, most spiritual day. That's why I actually don't coach to the flow state because I don't want to sell hope. I instead want to sell the resiliency to take a sub average day and make it great and to stick with it and to work through it. There's a lot that goes with this and a lot of it is changing the mindset about the way you prepare. So let's dig in a little bit. Today's discussion, we're going to go over how golfers train, and I want to compare and contrast that a little bit with the athletes I have in other sports that I work with. National championship teams across male and female sports. Individuals that are competing at different levels professionally. And some of the learnings I had as a pitcher that has really shaped my career as a PGA Tour psychologist to help people understand what those different factors are. 
and how to bring the better plan out into the preparation cycle. I'm going to take you through a practice periodization schedule and then teach you how to compete in your practice. And we're going to incorporate a concept that I call failure drills. And it's something that I developed a couple years ago that has had quite a large number of, I say, comments and discussions around it. But when you understand what the purpose of a failure drill is, you'll see why you need it in your game. Because golf is not a game of perfect, as Dr. Bob Rotella said many years ago. Golf is actually a game of failure. Baseball and golf are very similar. And I heard this a while ago, and I'm not taking credit for it, is baseball is not a game of failure. It's a game of opportunity. The ability to compete with the next opportunity after a failure. That's what golf is as well. Then I'm going to take you through a full step-by-step -step golf training system that I've developed. Uh, I took a lot of my years of work with my tour players and my elite athletes and started thinking about it. So let me put it into a better package that will help you in the way that you go about your training. So I got a bonus for you, it's free. Thank you for taking us taking time to do this webinar. I think I can really help you, but this is a drill that's gonna challenge you. And it's a drill that I created to give a player a little bit of an understanding of what it feels like to be in competition, to not make them walk out of there feeling confident and like, yay, I'm hitting it on the center of the club face, but instead to say, yay, I worked through a very difficult challenge. And it's what I call the obstacle course. Now, in order to get this PDF sent to you, you've got to stick around to the very end of the webinar. I don't need to drop in, drop out. I need you to stick with me, okay? Um, but let me, let me go over just a little bit here, and I'm going to give you a highlight of it. So what I want a player to do is to build confidence by hitting to different targets on the range. Now, these different targets, you're going to pick and stay with that target for 10 shots. So the first target is a target from 100 to 125 yards. So let's say there's a pin out in your driving range at 110 yards. That qualifies into zone number one. So you must hit that target nine out of 10 times. The PGA Tour average in 2018 was about, mm, you know, 19 feet. The best player on the PGA Tour last year did it in about 15 feet. So I want you to be a little honest with yourself that if you think a shot from 110 feet should be five feet every time, you have unrealistic expectations. It's about ex, uh, working through it and working through the, the process. Okay. Then once you complete zone one and you do it successfully nine out of 10 times, then you move to zone two, which is between 125 and 150 yards. And then what you do is, once you hit that one, you move to 150 to 175 yards then 175 to 225 yards. But this time at 175 to 225 yards, you must hit it eight out of 10 times instead of nine out of 10 times. And ladies or shorter hitters, don't worry, I'm gonna adjust this for you momentarily. Then you're gonna hit a target from 225 yards out. And you have to do that eight out of 10 times. Then we're gonna work on what I love about golf is having a fairway finder, like an alternative driving club. And that would be like a three wood or an iron or a hybrid that you like to hit off the tee on a shorter par four, one that's really tight. And in order to approach or complete this section, you got to execute it nine out of 10 times as well. And then the last station, the seventh station is the driver. And you must do that eight out of 10 times. Now, here's the deal. If you don't advance past a zone, there's two ways to do this. The first way is you just stay and start your 10 balls over again and stay on that zone until you get it. But if you really want to challenge yourself, if you fail a zone, you must fall back and execute the zone prior. So if you fail at number four, you must fall back to number three and execute number three in order to move back up to number four. Yes, it's going to take some time. But over time, you're going to realize what it takes to communicate to yourself mentally in your self-talk to drive your resiliency to continue to perform. Wouldn't it be great if you practiced harder than you tried to play? You got to remember what makes golf unique is that a lot of people pay money at a driving range just to relax and bang balls. But if you wanna lower your scores, we gotta change that, train, that, that mindset away from just going to the you know, driving range to hit balls and actually going with, their, with a purpose to get better. In the field of baseball where I come from, we see, um, we see a little bit of an issue of old batting cages are now in fairs and amusement parks and fun fair parks style things where you put a token in and you hit balls but true trainers don't go to those automated big training centers. They, yes, they hit in cages just like you should in driving ranges, 
but they go in with purpose and not just for relaxation. Now, if you're a shorter hitter, I'm gonna leave it up to you to adjust this. The first one, the first zone should be like a wedge. The second one should be a low iron approach shot and then slowly move it out. I'm gonna leave it up to you. It's not automatic. It's not this standard that you have to meet. And more importantly, it's how you challenge yourself. So we're gonna do a little text, a little drop in and make sure if you guys are all with me, good. Just shoot me a little message in the chat and I'll keep on going. This important facet of the obstacle course is that you are working from level to level and continuing to improve. And I want it to continue to drive and work harder and fight through because at some point in each of these different stages, you are gonna struggle. And you're gonna struggle because you're gonna get frustrated. And that's what I want you to do, okay? I love this drill. This drill is a challenge. I always struggle with individuals that are, that are on the range and don't know what to do to practice. Well, let's use the creative, the creative aspect of our mind and let's try some different things. And let's work to push to find the different perspectives that we have to challenge ourselves. A drill on the range is anything that we do to challenge ourselves. Sometimes we need drills that are for confidence, and in a minute I'm gonna tell you why you need some for failure. This drill would be a great, great failure drill, but we're gonna come back to that momentarily. So, for those of you who've never been around me, I'm Dr. Brett McKay. I'm a clinical and sports psychologist, and what that means is I've got my doctorate in clinical psychology, which means I was trained to work with people across every spectrum of life and their performance and their mental health. And I specialized in the combination between the medical illnesses and um, the, the ability to overcome the struggles that we're in from a coping mechanism standpoint. And it has led me into working with sports, bringing my background as a pitcher at LSU to help me understand how to cope through the ups and downs. Recently, a, a fantastic new press release has come out about Thomas Bjorn, the Ryder Cup captain, who's written a book, I believe, called Mind Game. I'm not sure exactly the title, but make sure you look it up. And that book is about the struggle mentally of what it takes to perform at this level. Golf is maddening at times. And so being a clinician, it allows me to understand the different perspectives that people are going through to help them cope for performance. I work with about 12 PGA Tour players. My very first client on the PGA Tour was a US Open champ and by the name of Graham McDowell and, and somebody I've been with for seven or eight years now and seen his success. And I also work with Brian Harmon, Patton Kazire, John Rahm, Billy Horschel, uh, Wyndham Clark, Josh Teeter, and uh, Hank Leviota, and so on. Some amazing guys. I also work with some LPGA players, several, several folks on the web.com and many elite college and developmental players. And the important reason why I work with players at all level, from, from what I call professional amateurs to competitive amateurs, all the way up to the PGA Tour, is the interaction that I have and the learning to go back and forth is important. Because what I tell all my players is I can give you some insight and I can give you some ideas, but ultimately at the heat of the moment, your job is to not take the information I give you and make it work. Your job is to take the information, filter it to make it work for you. Take the spirit of what either I tell you or your swing coach tells you or your putting coach and apply it and play with it. That's how we do it in life, is we're not living with absolute precision. We're living instead in the gray area and making it work for us. That's why I think my perspective has been effective. I do a lot of writing for Golf Magazine. Now I do a, a monthly, I don't want to say column, but a, a piece on Golf Mag for Golf Magazine. And if you look back about a month or two ago or in the spring, they had a feature article about me, which was, was surreal, humbling, and somewhat embarrassing. Um, and you'll also see me do some things for Golf Digest as well as the Golf Channel. I work in addition to working for my golfers. I'm also the sports psychologist for the University of Alabama Athletic Department, Roll Tide. I also work for Stanford University's athletic department, Florida State, Texas State, and universities across the Southeast in the country. So I love what I do, but it's more importantly how to help you get better. So let's talk about the concepts of practice a little bit and the involvement of how you prepare better. You know, I come from a different world. I come from baseball. And baseball is easy. If you were raising a kid in the game of baseball right now, you call your coach and the coach sends out a message to the 14 kids on the team and says, we're going to have practice on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday at 6 p.m. 
and we're going to play on the weekends on Saturday and Sunday. And the practices are organized. And as a mom, a dad, as a player, I don't really have to worry about what I need to do to prepare while I'm at practice. Somebody's doing that for me. But that's what makes golf difficult. We drop kids off at the range, we drop kids off at the golf course, and we tell them to go do it. And there's not much organization. And there's some great junior clinics and junior academies out there that have done an amazing job of structuring and developing a developmental framework. But a lot of the learnings that we've utilized in those developmental centers come from just our own experiences. And we've used learning theory for many years to help players understand how to get better. But what I've done is taken what I did as a pitcher and brought it to golf. Golfers by far are the worst practicers in all the sports, bar none. I think maybe the only people that are better, worst practicers would maybe be bullfighters. But the reality is golfers go out to practice to fix problems. They don't go out to get better for what they're going to go compete in. See, when I go to a football practice at Alabama and I watch the best college football coach to ever coach the game to take his players through different stations of training, he's putting stations in sometimes that are working on technique specifically working on game plan specifically, or working on competitive mindset. And some of those are at different phases in the practice when you're tired or not tired, okay? So just like the obstacle course, the drill I just discussed, you have to make the determination of what it takes to get through that threshold. And you have to make it work for you. So in other words, if you're a young player, then your range of acceptable is not 20 feet. It may be 20 yards left and right of the target from 100 to 125 yards. But the better you get, you're going to raise those standards. Well, Coach Saban or Coach Burtman that I play for, or all the other coaches I work with across the country and other sports have different challenge points of what they're doing. If they're teaching a player something new, they take them through a progression of giving them time to learn it. And this is something that Tiger Woods said years ago that I thought was brilliant. If I could find the original link, I'd send it out, but I can't. But they asked him what it takes to go through and practice a, uh, a mindset of putting in a new swing. And he said, I have to see it at home on the range in my own practice. Then I need to see it at home on the course under no pressure. Then at home on the course with pressure. Then out on the tour in the first or second round under pressure all the way up to a major in the final rounds. And that doesn't mean he doesn't stop, but that barrier, that understanding of bracketing of his performance is being scoped in the deeper and deeper he gets under increased pressure. So if our practice is about fixing problems, you're never gonna progress because you're always chasing the last fix that needs to get taken care of in order to feel better about yourself so that you believe that you can perform better. There is the fatal flaw of golfers' performance in their practice. You've got to challenge yourself in your practice and be challenging of your mindset at times. And at other times, you have to develop the confidence you have inside you. Confidence does not come from hope. Golfers, as I've alluded to, practice to hope to play better. Most, pra most golfers sit back after practice and think as they're getting closer and closer to competition that they hope that they're ready to compete and they hope that they play good as if to feel good about themselves. But athletes in other sports don't do that. See, they don't worry about if their practice is good enough because somebody else is in charge of their training. They worry about how they're going to perform in the increased pressure and increased intensity. But great players know they can rely on the training plan that's been developed for them. And that's why you'll see great teams make comments that nobody trains better than us will wear other people down and that we believe in who we are and what we are in order to be successful. Okay. So what I want you to understand is that as an athlete, as a player, your role is about developing your ability to handle the uncertainty through your practice. In baseball, I used to go out as a pitcher and I had a very systematic warm up I did every single day before a game and it mimicked exactly how I warmed up before practice. But I also knew in between games, what I did on a Tuesday impacted what I did on a Thursday. I didn't show up to the ballpark every day hoping that I would leave feeling good about myself. Instead, I would look for the pride of facing challenges that I had when I competed. It's really important that you understand what practice is all about. Practice is about sharpening up your ability to adjust to ever-changing environments. 
not to feel good about yourself. I want you to see the game like a training opportunity when you train at practice, not going through the motions and hoping that it's just going to show up when you get there. If we look at training across other competitive landscapes, I think it's important that we understand how different specialists. Now, these are elite, elite performers at the top of their game. But why shouldn't we learn that? And what makes it so unique for golf is that I'll work with individuals and I have worked with individuals at each one of these buckets who have switched to golf and assumed because they could conquer the strategies and the struggles in each of their buckets that golf will follow suit. But let's go back to what I said earlier. Golf is like a soap bubble. The faster you grab it, the faster it pops. Golf needs to be nurtured and it needs to trust that your hands, the hands that you have, are strong enough to support the most sensitive and finicky of performances. It's not hoping that you'll be able to hold up your hands. You train so you can keep your hands held up as long as you can. So the Navy SEALs train not for what they know. They train for what they don't know. They train that the main thing that they always know is that they will meet the challenge in front of them with the tools that they have. Same with fighter pilots. One of my favorite motivational speakers is a former fighter pilot by the name of Carrie Lorenz, one of the first female fighter pilots to fly off of aircraft carriers into combat. And she said that she was trained through the Navy and the Marine Corps that being a fighter pilot is about 80% what your training is and 20% your intuition. So in the heat of the moment, they want you to trust your intuition. But your intuition comes from what? See, fighter pilots don't spend all their time flying in beautiful weather, in easy conditions. They use simulations, challenges, and then, oh, it's just like the SEALs do, just like our fighter pilots and our surgeons, and I know I have a couple on the line tonight, is that you have different perspectives, and after the events and after the challenges, you reflect back and you do a full critical review of your training or your real events. The mindset doesn't change. See, if you walk away from practice wanting to feel good about yourself with the hope that you're going to play well, you're setting yourself up for significant disappointment. We must train harder to prepare better to compete at our best. And our best doesn't always mean hitting every shot perfect. To compete at our best means we stayed in the fight and got the most out of it every single day. One of the things I hear all the time from players is, I get, I get nervous before I compete. Is that a problem? Well, why wouldn't you? See, nervousness is nothing but psychophysiological, body and mind arousal to prepare you for the uncertainty. If I sat you outside of a big conference room and you heard noise on the other side and I said, listen, you're going to have to go into that other room and make a, make a presentation and I'll give it to you as you're walking up on stage and everybody you're speaking to is subject matter experts. And your ability to win or lose depends on your ability to deliver the message. Oh, and by the way, your stakes are you lose your job if you fail. And I'm not prepared. And your mind is going to go wild thinking about everything that you're going to struggle with. But you may tell yourself, well, it doesn't really matter. I'm not supposed to be prepared. But what happens if you believe that your preparation is good? What happens if you believe that your preparation is hopeful to give you a chance to succeed? What happens if you believe or hope that to be a great player, you have to perform well, or you're not going to be seen as a great player? Then what's going to happen is your preparation is going to become under pressure, and it's not going to prepare you for handling the resiliency. Instead, it's only going to prepare you for the great days, and that happens less than 5% of the time. Nerves are awesome, but there's a way that we handle it. So what I want you to understand is this process. It's what I call practice periodization. It is very important and it is very important for how you train. Well, if I ask a player, it doesn't matter what level, let's go to the range and hit some balls. We're gonna go out to the range and more than likely they're gonna stop, start with a very lofted wedge. And they're gonna start hitting some pitch shots, a little longer and stretching it out. And then the more they get loose, they're gonna move into hitting nine irons, seven irons, six irons. Then they're going to move to clubs with 
heads on it. And then they're gonna start hitting some targets. Then they're gonna extend it out to driver. And then we're gonna leave. Or they're gonna look at me and say, okay, now what? And never did they work on their mechanics until they start struggling with that progression. So you just trained yourself how to play yourself into doubt, but no golfer will ever leave the range until they fix it. So now you trained your mind how to get into doubt, and more importantly, you started the carousel of trying to fix the problem. And hence, the golfer trains to fix problems. This is hogwash. This would be the equivalent of me as a pitcher walking out on my third throw in the outfield trying to break off the nastiest slider I've ever seen. My arm's not loose, my body's not loose, and, and I've got pain there. Well, if you go to the golf course and hit balls, more than likely, unless you're under 18, it hurts on the first five to 10 swings. So why are we using our club to get loose? If you like to start with a lofted wedge, go to the chipping green and chip first. It'll allow your blood to get moving. But I want all of your training sessions, and there's four in golf, full swing, wedges, short game, and putting, to follow this three-step approach. Phase one should be a warm-up. The goal is to get loose and get your body moving, get your heart rate elevated, not to try to figure out how to hit a lofted wedge with tight hamstrings, tight back, with a soul that is built to interact with the turf. What I need you to do is to understand that before you start working through your progressions, you are really loose. So what I tell everyone, start with an eight iron. If you wanna to go to the range and start hitting balls. If you go to the chipping green, great. That's a great place to learn to feel bottom and to allow the club to move through with, an, with the right kind of club face. But start with an eight iron and just fire them off in the range. Let it rip, just let it go. Don't worry about how to do it mechanically or where it goes. I'm gonna say it. I don't care if you hosel rocket it 10 times in a row. The goal is to get loose and you've got to separate your, your mental checking of your training with the outcome. You're not even ready to go and you're already testing and checking, hoping to show yourself that you're good at what you do. Stop it. Let's break it down and segment it to separate the mind from the judgment. So we're just gonna get loose. Then we're gonna to move to phase two, is what I call foundations. You're gonna identify the two or three key foundations, and this should be something that you have a conversation with your swing coach, your putting coach, you can do this in every phase of your game, every time you go out to compete. What I want you to do is say, what is the most important one or two things that I need to do in my swing? Ah, Brett, in order for you to swing, what we need to do is make sure we take the club back a little bit more on plane, and when we make the through swing, instead of allowing our hands to get ahead and our side to open up, we wanna stay down the line a little bit. So here are two drills that I want you to work on every single day when you go to the golf course. That's a conversation you should have with whoever's working with you. Because see the alternative, the way that we go back into our practice that we, I described at the beginning, is that when you go in with the mindset of fixing problems, the fix is not the core foundations that drive your success. It's the alterations and modifications that you fell into that day, that worked in that setting that day. But how many of you have tried to repeat it the next day and couldn't do it? Because what got you there is not the same process that'll get you there the next time. You've got to understand your two or three foundations. And those foundations are critically important. But I want to separate the outcome from your process. Right now, we're going to focus on the internal focus the movement, and I don't care if you're more deliberate. If you're pre-round warming up, it may be 10 balls on foundation one, 10 balls on foundation number two. But if you're going for a longer practice session, I want you to do more during that time because then we're gonna to transition to the third phase, which is performance training. Performance is where you prepare your mindset for execution, not for mechanical training. Now we've gotta separate the how from the judgment. Now we're gonna go compete for the outcome and trust the mechanism we have in place. Okay, the competition. See, your competitive mind is a skill, it's a tool. And if it's not sharpened, it's gonna fall apart. You ever watch great golfers? They're amazing competitors. But if you go walk the fairways on the PGA Tour, yes, they hit remarkable shots. But when they get in trouble, they know how to bring themselves back. And training through this three-step approach will allow you to do that. Great practice should be 
25% foundations and 75% performance. I don't include warm up in that. Okay. I don't want you to do what you're doing right now, which is 90% foundations and 10% performance. For instance, let's take a look at putting for a moment. To me, the first putt that really matters for a putter is the five footer. If you could become elite at hitting five foot putts, which I gotta be honest with you, doesn't require a whole lot of hand-eye coordination and doesn't require a whole lot of physical prowess to be able to consistently hit five foot putts. Remember, they have miniature, miniature golf courses that people practice and play with, okay? It's a practice thing. But very few people really practice a five footer. If I told you that I challenged my PGA Tour players to hit five footers for an hour a day, you probably hit for 10 balls a day, maybe. You hit a few and then you move on and you're ready to try something new. I need to challenge you to be even better and to be more successful. And the way you do that is that you put yourself under practice, under training and you work on maybe a chalk line. A chalk line is a foundation. But when you're going to compete, you better have consequences. And your mindset and your arousal level must increase in order for you to be successful. Remember I talked to you about failure drills? See, a failure drill is a drill that you leave and you've been really challenged in order to overcome it. And I don't mean like, yeah, I hit 10 in the hole and I can leave. A failure drill is where you may leave really angry, really frustrated, and I've got to pull that doubt out of yourself. I gotta pull that fear out of yourself. I gotta pull that frustration out. Because frustration and confusion are critical for learning. Well, a failure drill is a drill that failure is in the choice. It is an option. And you gotta learn how to navigate through it. It may be a drill that takes you two or three sessions. I've got a putting drill that I've worked with with one of my PJ Tour players. I made a mistake. I gave it to him and did not tell him to stop after an hour. His caddy called me, awesome player. God, he's a good player. And said it took him three hours to complete it on a Tuesday out of the PGA Tour. And I almost felt bad. Thought, three hours? He said, I wasn't leaving until I completed it. I was so angry, I left, I went and had lunch. I, ch uh, I thought about changing putters. But you know what was interesting? When he completed it, he not only faced the fear, he faced the dragon meaning the competitive fire. And he found it because when he looked around left and right, he knew that no one else had done that out on that tournament that week. And he has that as a sense of pride that when most people would quit, he'd keep going. Now that's extreme, but PGA Tour players are extreme for a reason. So let me introduce you to this. This is really important. And this is something that I started sitting down with about a year ago. We're having some internal discussions in my office. And one of my colleagues said, can you describe your model of training for a player? And I kind of hemmed and hawed and went over a bunch of different ideas. And then it hit me. It's about a seven step process. That's a lot, right? No, it's not. Here it goes. With every one of my players, I've got to assess who they are, what they are, their mindset, and more importantly, kind of teach them how to make their own assessments. And then I set them up into training periods, like the practice schedule and drills and training them better. That then allows them to go into testing phases. If I'm building a bridge over a big crevice and I got to run trucks over it, I best believe that I've had the weight limit tested multiple times before it's ever had to take on the burden of the heavy loads. Well, in order for your game to take on the heavy loads that it takes to compete at the highest level, and whatever that level that is that you want it to be, to play better, to challenge your players better, you've got to test them. Testing isn't about hoping they walk out of there happy with a popsicle. It's about making them better and making them sit over there sometimes with those failure drills and think, I don't think I'm ever going to solve that. Have you ever, like I love to play the game Wordscape when I'm flying. Wordscape is a, a puzzle game of name of letters and words and you got to search based on the letters they give you and have you ever been so stumped on doing a game like that where you just cannot see the solution and then all of a sudden you see it and you're like oh my gosh that was the most simple word ever like it, the one that stumped me when i was on vacation the word that stumped me was boat b-o-a-t 
I sat on that puzzle because I'm not going to search and go on the search engine to find the solutions. That's cheating. I sat there forever. And I could, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, Boat? Boat! Oh my gosh, boat. Yes, boat! Now, every time I looked at the word scramble, I saw the word boat. But when you're competing and, you, and you're fighting yourself so hard, you can't see that solution until you can. That's what training should be. And the testing phase is what that's all about. Because when we go into competition, the anticipation is that feeling of arousal and anxiety you feel before you ever get into the competitive moment. Because then we move into competition. And we think we should stop there, right? Negative. That's a negative, Ghost Rider. We need to compete to learn about ourselves, to build more knowledge, to reinvest into our assessment training. Oh, yeah, in that last phase, I just said it, reinvestment. See, there's a process here of the attacker because I want you to be aggressive when you play. I don't want you to be passive. It's not a golf is a spiritual experience. Anything that you're doing committed to yourself is a, is a spiritual experience, in my opinion. But golf is a puzzle. It's one that's going to challenge your knees, your arms, your legs, and skin them all up. It's going to challenge that noggin that you have to be the best that you can. And there are some days where you just don't have it. You know, the old saying, sometimes you're the bug and sometimes you're the windshield. Well, that is true in this game of golf. Sometimes you will get run over. Sometimes you will leave the golf course feeling angry and disappointed and question your self-esteem and your self-worth. And sometimes you're going to be really upset. And then other times you're going to leave and you feel like you're the greatest player to ever cross the game. You're going to get text messages from the players that you coach that tell you, I won, that was the greatest. And then you're going to get a message like, I, I don't even know how to get the ball on the club face right now. I am so lost. But having a bigger perspective and understanding will help you. So let's dive in. Section number one is the assessment. If you want any chance of performance at any level, you must know who you are and make an accurate assessment of your state of your game. Too often I hear players tell me that they're a great driver of the ball, great, superb, but I, I'm a terrible putter. And yet the data suggests that they may miss one or two drives, right? Or three drives, but their putter is actually pretty good. A while back I had a, I had a player call me and said, Doc, I, I'm really struggling with birdie putts. For some reason, I can't make them. I get stressed. I said, all right, how many birdie putts have you had over the last three tournaments? Okay, three, three rounds. He said, in 54 holes, I have, I have 24 birdie putts inside 20 feet. That's pretty good, y'all. He's a college player. And I said, how many did you make? He said, 10. I remember it was 10. So, so you're converting at almost 50% of your birdie putts. That's incredible. Something ain't right here. And what we found out by doing the assessment was it wasn't his putting for birdie. It was the fact that this was an elite ball striker, but when he missed a green, he couldn't get the ball up and down. His short game was really a challenge. So he had a lot of 8 to 10 to 15 foot par putts, and he missed those. And so when he put the pressure on himself and hit it to 12 feet for birdie, he forgot that he had hit – he maybe made two or two or so in his mind. He had to make all of them. His assessment was skewed. A couple of years ago, I had a player that came and saw me that was fearing the snap hook with the driver. This was a, um, a web.com player. And so I'm out there on the web.com player and I'm on the range and I'm watching him hit it and it is flawless. I mean, bottle it up and sell it. Beautiful ability. And it was something weird that happened. I said, all right, let's start. Let's put some angles out here. And I said, we're going to hit over here. And he gets on the right side of the teeing ground. And he aims down the left side. And he hits a five-yard draw. And the ball goes outside of the – and he goes, oh, that's not good. Puts another one down. It hits a 10-yard draw. And he goes, there's the, there's the snap hook. And I said, what are you trying to hit? And he said, I'm trying to hit a cut. I said, why? He said, well, my coach told me that with my swing speed that a player like me should hit a cut. And it would be easier to control. I said, so you're getting on the right side of the fairway. I said, have you always hit a cut? He said, no, I've always hit a draw. He said, but I've been working on the swing change and that a cut's going to allow me to keep the ball and play more. I said, I'll tell you what's going to keep the ball and play more is get on the left side of the tee box, aim down the right side, and let's hit that five to 10 yard draw and let's rip it. And he gets on the left side, went out and played 18 holes. He didn't miss a tee shot. And he ended up having a very successful season on the web. All we did is we had to get to the root of the problem. As a psychologist, many times what we think we, is the thing that's upsetting us 
is not the root cause. How many times have you had negative thoughts in your head and it makes you feel a certain way and you think you know what's the real issue, but what's the real issue is the thing in the shadows and the closet behind that, that you're not willing to admit is what's really bothering you. For a lot of us players, the issue is not that we can't do it. It's the fact that we're afraid that other people aren't going to see our value because we can't do it. It's not because I can't do it. You ever wonder, want to know why a young kid struggles and puts up this big drama show when they miss a putt? It's because they want other people to see that they should have made it, not because they're really upset that they didn't make it. Yeah, they got a little upset at them. See, we got to learn to assess to figure out what it is. Then we move into our training phase. As we've discussed, golfers are not developed the same as athletes in other sports. And I've talked about the myths of golf training over the years. And some of that is that we expect to play well all the time. And for instance, a PGA Tour player wins 80% of their money in five events a year. And that's just some data from Rich Hunt, who's a great follow on social media. Uh, I think he goes by Richie Three Jack. That must be an issue with Richie. Um, but I love Rich's work. And he talks long and hard about what it takes to compete at that level. And statistically, they win 80% of their money in five events a year. So that means 80% of the events they play in, which is about 20 to 22 events a year, they don't have their good stuff. You know, how many times have you seen a player miss a cut one week and win the next? They're, they're feeling despondent one week and the next week they find something. They didn't search, they didn't call their coach, they didn't change what they were doing. They stuck with it and they kept playing with that puzzle piece until it came into clarity. But if your mindset is that that puzzle piece must always find the corner and find the perfect spot that fast every time, you're never going to perform well. Then we move into testing. Now, I don't want you testing your abilities on the golf course. What I'm talking about is in your practice. It's challenging yourself. If you don't have a great short game, find people around your practice and challenge them. Keep pushing yourself. Keep challenging yourself. Keep going as hard as you can in your testing. Then we move into our anticipation phase. And this takes a lot of awareness to understand what that pre-arousal is inside you. When you feel it bubbling up, why? What negative thoughts does it bring out? What stresses does it bring? What does it make you worry about? Why is it when you go under pressure and all of a sudden you start looking at putts differently? And then I hear all the time, yeah, but when I play with my friends and I don't care, I play great. So what changed under pressure? You gotta understand what that anticipation is. We don't wanna ignore it. We wanna understand it. I wanna make you uncomfortable because the best that you've ever played is when you are uncomfortable. One of my dear friends is a PGA Tour coach, swing coach, works with a lot of elite players. And he, he and I have been talking for many years. And Mark Blackburn, um, some of you know him, but he made a comment one day while we were having dinner out on tours. He said, I fear the A game on Tuesdays and Wednesdays with my players. It raises expectations and increases pressure. I don't like the C game. But man, do I love the B game if they're willing to grind. He said, most of my players have won with their B game on Tuesday. And it may have been a B minus, maybe a C plus. They stuck with it. They simplified their process. They understood what they felt and they developed a better game plan. Because when we move into competition, you don't need to play relaxed. You can't play with a quiet mind. A quiet mind is a focused mind. It's not an absent mind. It's developing strengths. That's why I love what Scott Fawcett has created with Decade. It's not for everybody. But you should find what's what it is for you out of it. And that's an important understanding. Remember, I told you it's your job to filter information. I want you to filter what it takes in order to apply it under pressure. And the way we do it is we learn. See, too often in competition, players come back to me and they're embarrassed. They're disappointed. They're frustrated themselves. And when I ask them the question, what did you learn? It's like it's a slap in their face because they shouldn't have had to experience that struggle. I've done all this work. Really? Really? If the best players in the world struggle and learn from it, why can't you? That's why I love the book by Ryan Holiday, The Obstacle is the Way. And his follow-up book, The Ego is the Enemy, is talks about that same exact issue as to why we think we shouldn't struggle. 
Learn from it. It's a valuable gift that's been given to you. Golf is a competition against yourself, the golf course and the leaderboard. But it's not a competition solely against yourself. See, when I ask players, who do you compete against? Myself. Against what standard every day? Every single day you reach your hand into a bucket and it pulls out a ticket and you have to play 18 holes in order to scratch off what that ticket says. But if you quit midway through, then you never got to see what the real outcome is. Because we got to develop knowledge. Man, many, many years ago, we climbed mountains to go to the wise man and wise woman of the, of the village and they would share their guidance. And the wise one was never built from just because they were smart. It was because they were experienced. And so I want you to gain golf wisdom, to learn how to accurately review your rounds so that you can build knowledge from round to round. Because if you really struggle today, then you gotta learn how to apply. Now, I don't know if that lesson's gonna come right back up again. Sometimes it takes a while to circle back. When I have players who um, have fallen short, you know, they wanna hurry up and get back in that exact same scenario and the game doesn't always allow them that. Several years ago, I started a winning program for a player who, who got frustrated that they continued to put themselves in the heat of the moment and continued to slide back. But it wasn't until we had gone through the knowledge building and the assessment and the training and the competition, the different facets of the attacker model, did we understand that what happened was this high speed player started trying to hit flighted shots under pressure. And so what we did is instead of flighting shots, we got more aggressive. I allowed him to, instead of hitting a seven or a six that was flighted, I encouraged him to hit a harder eight iron. And the player won on a very challenging golf course. And what happened was it was unlocking who they were through their experience. And yes, when it matched that week, it worked. It's not always a high speed player is gonna be able to get a four iron on the, on the ball the way they want to every single time. But this player was not perfect through those 72 holes but instead learn to stay around long enough that when the goodness hit, they were ready to turn it in and make it, make it go. The last one is how to reinvest it in your game. See, this pulls back to the wisdom, but if I go to a, if I go to class and I do a, a college course for six months uh, or four months on World War II history, and somebody asks a question about World War II, do I need to sit there and go, okay, February 4th, Professor Martin told me that this happened. No, you automatically, your brain pulls it up sometimes. Or other times you have to think, okay, I remember them talking about this and that was led to by that. Okay, and you can pull it up. Unfortunately, too many of our players today have Google at their handset or they have swing videos all over the web that tells them how to hit it versus figuring it out. You want to reinvest in your game you got to learn how to figure it out see you got to learn what the four-step process is which is identify what the real target behavior is what is the real issue and that first phase of that is your assessment and once you identify the target behavior we're going to solve the target behavior that's the second one then we're going to enhance other skills then we're going to move to mastery every one of you has one or two bugaboos that you got in your golf game that you want to improve we're gonna get that improved so that we can help your confidence increase. But we don't stop there hoping that nothing is ever gonna happen again. Just like the military, we go through conflict and then we train and train and go through exercises. And sometimes they're completely made up and probably not even relevant, but it's to keep skills sharp. So the attacker is that approach. It works for every single person that I've ever worked with in golf. It's about assessing who you are, what you are, the way you think under pressure. It's about training, training yourself and training through a systematic approach. I love it when I hear golf coaches tell me that block practice is bad because there's been a big move recently about that. Thinking, well, if somebody doesn't know how to grip a club or doesn't know how to get the ball on the bottom of the club face or you know, to, to hit the bottom in the right spot or doesn't know how to hit a putt on the center of the putter face, why are we going to do a whole bunch of random stuff? So we have to have a balance, and that's what appropriate strategic training program is all about. Then we're gonna to move to testing. We're gonna train ourselves. And if training tells us something's not right, we go back to, if the testing tells us something's not right, we're gonna go back to training. And then we're gonna move all the way through this process. Never met a player who wasn't prepared for it, and never met a player that couldn't benefit from this process. 
So what? So what do we do now? I, mean, I just gave you my secret of why I work with so many players. Seriously. And the job is to hold you accountable. But it's kind of like when I bought those Pelotons from my basement and they're still sitting down there. And every once in a while I walk by and they tell me I haven't been on it in a while. Yep. See, a training plan is just as good as the way you use it. And I have a thousand square foot putting green in my office. I don't really practice on it because I always say I'm busy. The reality is I don't want to go in and do it and work through the difficulty. Because in order to be better, I got to go into the deep closets of my fears and doubts and insecurities. I got to go to the places where I don't feel I'm really good and learn to strengthen myself. Remember that bridge I told you that was going to span the crevice? Well, it takes the engineers to go into un underneath it while they're taking a heavy load and going, we need to reinforce the joists here in order to make it stronger. It hasn't performing like we thought. It doesn't mean we suck. It doesn't mean we are terrible engineers. It just means based on the trials that we're going through right now, I got to get up there and reinforce it. What's wrong with that? Based on what I did the last time I played in the tournament, I need to get better inside five feet. Yes, there I said it. I need to learn to hit drivers and not hanging on. My strength is I hit drivers hard. And when I lock in, I hit them great. But if I'm hanging on for dear life, you might as well hang me off the edge of the cliff with my fingernails. I'd rather jump off the cliff. Okay? So, $16 million won by my players in 2018. It's pretty damn good. So, I'm going to make that system available to you. Seriously, here's how we're going to do it. So, what I did is this attacker model, I developed it and put together an entire training program. Yeah, entire video training. It's awesome. It's probably the best training program I've ever done. We've held on to it for a little while. And we've held on to it for a reason because we didn't feel like it was the right time to release it. Just didn't want to release it and let it go. We want to release it because we think it has great value to you. So what does this include? And I'm gonna pull up that offer so you can see it. Okay, for 90 minutes now, you're gonna have this available to you. And I'm gonna publish this in a second. This model is, um, I, I want to say it's like 25 or 30 videos. I can't remember how many it is. That's a lot, but it's damn good. I mean, it's really good. And it has all the different assessment uh, modules of the attacker from assessment training. So you've got in the assessment, six most important questions to ask in your game, five personalities of elite competitors. Do you know how to improve? Module two, training, five myths of, great, of myths in golf training, the training model framework, long green training, short game training, training on the green. Module three, testing. Why golfers struggle in competition, using competition and performance training, the use of failure drills. Module four, that anticipation. Okay. Module five, win every moment, the psychophysiological response to pressure, the five keys of mindset in the moment, the funnel foot. Listen, if you want to watch something and not get caught up watching just lazy old videos on YouTube and you actually want to get better, get this. Seriously, it's amazing. How to be a knowledge builder and how to reinvest. Okay, so you're going to get this. I'm going to publish the offer right now. So now it's going to start. It's going to be available for the next hour and a half. What is this value? You get the attacker training golf system and you got you get six PDF practice development plans included in this course. We don't only charge 500 bucks. This is a pre-release time. You're getting it right now for $149 for the next 90 minutes. This is uh, if you're part of my insiders club on Facebook and you want to have inside access to how I train my athletes and the questions and you can have one-on-one -on -one question and answer sessions with me on my Insiders Club. If you want more information on the Insiders Club, make sure you check it out on my website, brettmccabe.com and click the link. There's a special coupon code just for you as my insiders. That's going to reduce that price even more. Guys, listen, I know what my hourly rate is. You're going to get almost two hours of video directly for significantly less than what my hourly rate is. When I'm out on tour at the PJ Championship, the US Open, the Masters, and the different facets of where I go, I'm out there for a period of time. You're getting that insight right to you. So how does it work? Just click the Add to Cart button on the right side of your screen. Enter your payment information. Sorry, we got to do that. Create your own unique username and password and go straight to the attack report. You'll get started immediately. With your username and password, you'll have 24-7 on-demand access to all video content. Click the training center tab and you'll see all seven modules and take the information and send me messages. I'll be happy to answer anything you have about it. Very responsive. You join the Insiders Club, it's almost immediate. Okay. 
go to brettmccabe.com by clicking online training login. It is a great way to continue to go back to it. I want your feedback and I want to answer your questions uh, in the chat. Yes, Matt, would this apply in junior development? 100%. Um, I think any coach that coaches players should consume the video course and also make it a recommendation for every single parent or player out there. I cannot stress that enough. This is a framework that if I had a junior development program, I had 50 kids in my program, I'd have 51 versions of this video course. It's that important to me because I want to be on the same framework that I'm working with my juniors on, that they understand where I'm coming from and they understand what I'm trying to get the most out of them. So when we have a failure drill, they don't think I'm being rude and mean. It's a really, really good challenge to go with. It's great for coaches, it's great for individual players, and it's great for developing players. What other questions do we have? And I'm happy to answer anything that you guys have. I do read every single comment. And you send it to contact at themindside.com, it all comes to me. What about collegiate golf and for college coaches? 100%. As college coaches, um, I think there's a major problem in college coaching today, and I work with a lot of great college teams, uh, is that we just assume that the players are ready. We can't do that. We have, to, we have to work and interact with the swing coaches and the putting coaches. Players are coming into college today with four and five people on their team. They may have me. They may have a swing coach. They may have a short game coach. They may have a putting coach. They may have a strategy coach and Scott Fawcett. They may have a nutritionist and a physio. They may all these other people. And that makes it hard as a college coach. But your job is to be the center of the spoke with the player and work to bring in all that information to help develop them. Well, if the mindset of the way you train is not laid out, when I tell you that 90% of the players I work with have no clue what the proper way to train is, they don't have any idea what the proper mechanisms are to put a training plan together, why assume that they do because they can flush seven irons on the range? This will never hurt them to train better. Now, what I want you to do is encourage them in training um, and train them to, um, to be in the, that elite frame of mind, but to take what works for them. Like there are some players that I can't ask to stay on the putting green for hours. And yes, I don't care if they put AirPods in their ears and listen to music, it keeps them out there. But if they're just going through the motions, rolling balls down chalk lines, they're not practicing. If they want to learn to get better, show them videos of Steph Curry as a three-point shooter. Ask if their practice looks like that. And all they usually see is him shooting from the, the tunnel. But they miss the fact that he usually starts out every practice dribbling left-handed and shooting layups and jump shots left-handed, even though he's a right-hander. Um, is the No, Jim, it's the, so the question is, is the system different from the attacker model in the in module of the Mindside Academy? Um, no, no, no. It's the same exact system as in the Mindside Academy. So the attacker model was released on a short period. It was it kind of, uh, in all honesty, it got released before we were ready to go. It, it slipped through the cracks, and then we took it down. Um, but we had some very early people who bought in, and I'm very appreciative to those that did. You just got it before we sent it out. But winner, winner for that one. What are some key traits you should look for in a swing coach? Well, I think the first thing a swing coach is somebody who's knowledgeable, but that I love the argument that's going in in this world right now about technical, because there's a fight between being really, really technical and really, really kind of holistic. Why does it matter? Why don't we find what's right for the player? I work with some amazing swing coaches that can teach with a T in their hand and others that teach with brilliant technology at their fingertips. I work with some amazing people who have unbelievable technology at their fingertips, but then will teach without any technology to the next player that comes in. So I think the number one swing key, or trait of a great swing coach is somebody who's truly interested in the player and knows how to interact with the player. And that doesn't mean that they have all the answers, but they are willing to work to find the solution. But I, one thing I always try to tell players, and players will come to me and say, hey, you know, I, I went to a talk by another mental coach, or I read a book, and, and they're almost apologetic. And my answer to that is, why would you be apologetic? I think that's incredible. Get as much information as you can. Remember, the player's job is to be, um, be in the mindset of filtering for what works for them. We all go to a steakhouse. 
we're all going to um, we're all going to um, order our steaks different. Some are going to like it medium rare. Some are going to like it rare. Some are going to like it spicy. Some are going to like it plain. Some are going to put ketchup on it. <clears throat> God forbid. Some of them are going to put steak sauce. But we all have it different. Okay. Um, I think there will be a replay of this program. I think you should get an email that will allow you to watch it again. Um, what are some? What is the putting game? Um, I've got a variety of different putting games. Justin, if you reach out, we'll, we'll put them up on the website. I know they're all on our Insiders Club right now. Um, it's the best place to get them. And as I develop them, we get them. I want some that build confidence. I want some that challenge. Uh, that putting game in particular was hitting putts from 3 feet, 5 feet, 8 feet, and 12 feet. Um, and it was a challenge. So uh, check it out. Uh, would you recommend on-course games such, I hate, such as worst ball? Well, sorry, I hate worst ball. The worst game ever. Because if I hit a good shot, I should never have to hit another one as good. Because what it took mentally for me to hit that good shot. Now, I do love best ball, okay, if, it, if the purpose of the game is to build confidence. Now, here's a game that I'd rather you play rather than a worst ball. Don't hit second shots. What? Huh? Yeah, if you hit a bad shot, you got to own it, live in it, get it up and down, and challenge yourself. I also love a game where, and I learned this from another instructor, that every approach shot must miss the green. You know, oh, that's not going to be good for my game. Listen, you're hitting to a target. If you miss a green, you got to get it up and down. If you hit the green, you get punished. It's whatever it takes to create the mind of, like, how, if you played other sports growing up, did you ever go in your backyard and shoot baskets and make up your own shooting games? Were those detrimental in any way? Uh, not really. I mean, I think it was really good for you. And then you play with it and you're like, oh, that's what I'm doing. I mean, I think we should have like targets and obstacles on the on the range. Like you got to pitch and chip over stuff. Jeff, you asked a question. I hope this training model helps with short game struggles. Yes. Put a ball bag five feet in front of you and chip over it to a target. It's an amazing drill. Something I was going to give you here real soon. So five feet in front of your ball, five yards in front of your ball, just put a milk buck, milk crate and chip over it. It's amazing how you do with that. But we get so caught up in trying to teach people how to do it right, we don't allow their minds to figure out how to get through it. I've shared many times um, that I love my I love a swing aid called the Orange Whip Wedge Trainer because I had the yips chipping. I had bad technique with a lot of anxiety about it. I will tell you right now, I'll go out and chip with anybody around because I took the Orange Whip Wedge Trainer which kind of took a little concept from two, um, uh, two golf coaches in Europe by the name of Peter Arnott and Graham McDowell, not the player, the coach. And they have a thing called constraints-based learning, which is this idea that you have to face the struggles and the challenges you're going through to, make, to learn how to overcome it. So what they do is they give a wedge to beginners and say, figure out how to get the ball in the air and on the green. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. Figure it out. Well, with the Orange Whip Wedge Trainer, I had to figure it out. Okay. Um, and if you, you know, it, it helped me. But if you watch my technique, I dropped my left foot way back. I choked it down to almost the, uh, almost the steel. And I play the ball back in my stance. And I can flop it, bump it, chip it, bump, you know, whatever it takes. And I figured out my way. And I love it. So I think we got to learn to allow ourselves to challenge ourselves. But I love chipping over things. I love putting under things. I love hitting drivers. Like when was the last time you went on the range and said, I'm going to hit a hard draw. I'm going to start it on the right flag and try to draw it to the left flag. And then I'm going to try to hit a hard fade where I'm going to start it on the left flag and try to make it go to the right flag. Like people are thinking, oh my goodness, why would I ever do that with this wide variation of my swing? Why not? If you did that a couple times and you tried to hit a straight one, I'll guarantee it'll look like a laser. Okay. So what I want you to understand is that in your training, create a lot of variability and a lot of challenge. What is the greatest challenge you face when working with tour players? The environment of the moment. Um, the, the environment that motivated them to make the changes in their game. Okay, this is important that you understand this. Most of the time they come in and they're fired up to get after it. I'll do whatever it takes. And that initial pain goes away and their effort in that moment gets pulled away by distractions or other demands they have on their life because they have a lot of demands, okay? So what happens is that I'm fired up. We're gonna do, we're gonna get this. 
Yes. And then over time, I don't hear from them as much. I got to chase them. So the motivation that usually starts a training program is never the motivation that maintains it. So you got to be aware of that and continue to work on it. Um, how do you proceed after we pay for the system? Do we get a link to where you should log in? I just got a message um, from uh, Brett Basham and my team. He said, you should have immediate access and it should redirect them to the training center. They will, they will definitely have a link in their email to click. If you don't get something, make sure you check out contact at the mind sign. We'll get that answer to you. What ways are you, have you helped guys get through Monday qualifiers? See good numbers at home, not great or good enough to get through competition. Uh, Justin, the first thing that I always tell players on Monday, comp uh, Monday qualifiers is that's not real golf. That's drag racing. Okay. Um, and it's very hard to take any value away from a Monday qualifier other than did you get in or not? Unfortunately, too many players think they have to go out and birdie 17 holes in a row in order to get it. They put way too much pressure on themselves based on what they do prior to the, um, the training program. Uh, meaning they stand up, they play at home with their buddies, they play around the course where they're comfortable, they may play main tours, they go to a qualifier. Let's look at the word, qualifier. Only four people are gonna get in. You gotta go low and you gotta go low fast. But the reality is players don't usually birdie the, the first eight holes to win the qualifier. They, get, they stay patient long enough to get on a hot run. But they have to trust that sometimes that when they know they gotta make four birdies in the last six holes, they get a little bit more aggressive and reckless. And so they can't look at it and say, ah, oh, choke coming down the stretch. What really happens is that qualifier is a drag race. And the best know when they get out there, they don't have to do anything different. They know it's all or nothing, and it means no validation for who they are as a player. I hate the mini tour mindset for players. I'm gonna sleep in my bed, I'm gonna go play a couple mini tours, make a little money, come back. That, that's a mindset to win on that tour that's different to what it takes to win on the web tour, to win on the PGA tour. It's the same thing as people winning at their club championship. That's where they're comfortable, it's where their friends are, but it's understanding that it's one step in the stairway. It's not an immediate one-to-one. -one. So what I want them to understand is that when they go to a Monday qualifier, it's freaking hard. Be prepared for it. And just because you get, on, get into a tournament does not mean that you're ready to play in the tournament. You've got to go into tournament prep mode. And I have a lot of players have a lot of success with Mondays, but it's having to change that. How long is it, Jake, how long does it take to complete the attacker system? I think you can probably finish it in a night if you really were that into it, but you're not going to retain all the information. So I would go through each module one at a time. It's kind of like how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time. And you need to learn and take notes. The secret is in your interpretation and application, not in this magic insight that's gonna go off in your head. Okay? All right. Kenny also asked a question, so besides price list, what's the greatest challenge you face when working with tour players? The greatest challenge I have for me professionally is that I wanna be my best to the best players in the world, and I wanna be my best to every player who walks in the door. Okay, so I need to keep my skills sharp. And it's very easy to get caught up in the drama of bad play and assume that great play is gonna stick around forever. It doesn't. We got to be prepared for the ups and downs. Are my student web.com players struggling with seeing bad shots in the range. What are some tact tactics to help them? You're going to love this. Make them see bad shots on the range and then learn to hit good shots through it. A bad shot means nothing more than a bad shot. Okay. How do you teach a three point shooter to not see balls, you know, not going in as you shoot a whole lot of them. And then they learn to start focusing on making the ones and realizing the bad shots don't mean anything. More than likely the bad shot on the range, is tapping into his insecurity that he doesn't believe he's good enough to be there. And you may say, oh, no, 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 he says he's good enough. Then that bad shot wouldn't have a meaning. There's something in there is what that bad shot's reflecting on. Okay, thank you for your time. And uh, thank you for a great presentation. Well, thank you for being here. Uh, it's truly humbling that people take the time to sit in and listen to what I have to say. And I mean that in all sincerity because I, always wanted to be in a place where I got to educate on something I believed in, and now I get to do that on a regular basis. So thank you for all the support that you guys have given me. Make sure you check out the attack model. I'm, just, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's fantastic. Um, this is my heart, sweat, blood, and tears. I, I am an avid consumer of what it takes to get players performing at the highest level. I don't read a lot of sports psychology books. I read a lot of performance books in other areas and how people perform. Um, the fact that you guys are here and listening to what I have to say is humbling. 
Um, but it's also an honor and it's an honor that I hope I continue to maintain for the next 30 years of my career and you guys continue to raise my level each and every day. So thank you very much. Y'all have a great night.